Hi, Scott. Uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, we, we, we'll... Lockdown stuff, I think we'll leave to the end if, if we need to discuss it at all. So let's let's talk about the wider picture. So can you uh, introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about your involvement with creative arts? Uh, so uh, my name is Scott Turnbull. Uh, oof, wow, we, uh, if, it, it's try and condense it all into a, a little a small amount of time. Uh, what I graduated from, I can't even remember what the college was called. Now it wasn't Stockton Sixth Form. It was it was Stockton Riverside College, and did like an acting course there. Then went and studied at uh, Lipper in Liverpool. Uh, graduated from there. Did a few bits of telly. Uh, worked in uh, regional theatres, doing all manner of things. Then started making my own work, which started with a, my debut show, Where Do All Dead Pigeons Go? And I'm currently writing a new show called Tales from the Smog, which is a, a supernatural uh, sci-fi noir thriller. Set in Teesside, of course. Brilliant. Okay, so um, uh, you, so you studied. Did, was, it, was this stuff you'd always dabbled in from a kid? Did you come from a creative background? How how did you get involved in all this? I don't know. All all it was right is I, I was saying to my pal the other day that I remember there was a drama teacher at school. Oh, and this sounds really cheesy, but it's like but it's basically what you know. I, I was. It, I'm not even going to go into it. Like you know, I was I was pretty good at drama and art at school and um, and she just uh, when I left school I went in uh, like I went uh, in unemployment straight away uh, in, in I guess one of the reasons is there's not many jobs about but the other reason was I was quite born idle and uh, and so spent a couple of years on the door and then went to college to, oh, we did a New Deal course first and foremost. That was it, right? So we did this New Deal course where you were um, you fill in timesheets and and you go to a job. It's like um, and one of the things we did with editing at the Ark in Stockton with with um, you basically go out with a with a film crew, a small film crew, which was you, right, and a presenter who was a guy. I can't even remember what he was called. And you go and interview people. And I remember filming this guy doing the interviewing and thinking to myself, I'd rather do that, right? I'd rather be in front of the camera than behind it. And then after that, um, yeah, went to college and did uh, performing arts at college. And then got, okay, so I'm going to keep on talking. So basically at the end of the first year at the college, they were like, oh, here's a form, you know, here's a form to fill in for university. And I was like, oh, well, in my head, I was like, I'm not going to university. This is like, the only reason I came to college was to stop like arguing with our mum and uh, kind of do the New Deal thing. Cause you get you get paid an extra six quid a week or something to do it, right? And then, but, but then you fill in the forms, you send them off, got a, got an offer from, from Lipper to go and study there. And then before you know it, everyone's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely got to do that. And so you do. And then, then three years after that, you, you then leave there and you're getting employed to do the acting and, and all that kind of nonsense. And it's like, and so, yeah, and it just kept on going from there, I suppose. Brilliant. So um, can you tell people a little bit about, um, about the, the your, well, your pieces, where, where the ideas from, uh, what they're about. I got, I, I, it leapt to my attention because somebody, it was like a mix between Twin Peaks and you'll probably remind me what else made me go, oh, that, that, uh, that I'd go down to that. But it wasn't anything like I was expecting. And uh, it was one of the most creative things I've seen on a stage for, for many years. And it was, uh, it, it was the writing itself, but also the, the format that you use. So can you tell us a bit about that? Well, I, mean, I, guess, I guess the thing is that it, I use like the old overhead projectors that you used to get at school. And so that's that I always use the projectors for imagery and then tell like a, a human story within it. And the first show, Where Do All the Pigeons Go, was loosely based on uh, a 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, where you've got like a lonely man who's aboard a moon base sending messages off into the universe. And his only companion is uh, 
a computer program based on the former Middlesbrough FC manager, Tony Mowbray. And so you've got this relationship between them. And as the story unravels, you kind of, you start questioning, well, first and foremost, the, you know, his, his sanity and his reliability as a narrator to you, the audience, and what kind of story you, you're listening to. It goes from like, and obviously it's always quite absurd and surreal and unnerving and also uh, kind of, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, uh, heartbreaking, heartwarming and meaningful at the same time. And then and then the new one that we've done, you know, that's, that, you know, they, they talk about like tricky second albums and things like that, I guess. Um, this one is about trying to figure out how to how to find that same resonance by creating a, a character or a world of characters that you as an audience can relate to and feel some kind of empathy for. And that's what we're trying to do within the rewrites now of trying to create this detective who's fallen from the top of the Swallow Hotel in Stockton. And as he falls from the top to the bottom, you, his life passes before his before his eyes. And we're basically, we're really leaning towards the um, the film noir narrative in this one. And we're, we're even like pushing the, pushing the Blade Runner boundaries a little bit, um, a little bit harder. So, you know, expect, you know, some, some kind of sci-fi, sci-fi noir with Voight Kampf, um, Voight Kampf tests and all that kind of nonsense. Well, it, if you need a prop, I have, um, I have a, there's a game, the Blade Runner game, like the Voight Kampf test. I've got the box of it. So it's got like, you basically play, like you're dealt a card, whether you're like human or replicant, and then uh, your opponent has, a, a, I think, eight questions to work out whether or not you are. Really? That sounds great. Did a really nice little kit. Um, it's a crowdfunded thing. Yeah. And of course... Uh, Oh, God, sorry. Uh, on the Blade Runner theme, um, it, I don't know if you can tell, it's really raining in here. I have to hide in the back to do my interviews because busy, busy home life. This is a lockdown yeah, yeah. project. Tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved with uh, the Blade Runner convention last year. Also, uh, uh, Annabelle Ark, who's uh, the artistic director there, got in touch with us and said, like, uh, oh, we've just had this... Um, uh, you know, commission come through to do uh, uh, do Android's Dream of Electric Sheep. Have you, have you ever heard of that? And all of that. Yeah. Like, you know, don't don't ask anybody else. Give it straight to me. <laughs> so, like, so, I mean, I spent, you know, a lot of time, cause it was a really busy time of year, but at the same time, you know, you do the best things out of love. And it was like, so I got I got that commission basically, read through Electric Sheep a couple of times, watch Blade Runner and the making of, and then try to do like um, you know, an even more Teesside mashup of the uh, of the original and created like I mean you get to see it, right? And there's the uh I did, I did. I ended up um, going a bit garrotty on your pinata, as I remember. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, you, oh, yeah, I mean, but that's what it's there for. You know, I can't give you a rolling pin and a pinata and expect you not to go. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, there's, a, you know, I did the, the, the Voight Kampf with the, uh, with the Leon Kowalski character. But in in his but he, I mean because the thing is I've got him as a little dog at the minute in my head he's he's a dog rather than the um, the the actor I don't know who the actor is but you know yeah so uh, yeah it, it, I mean that was that was a lot of fun and it's something that's kind of it's it's informed uh, some of the work that I've done recently as well. So did you know Paul Sullivan from Liverpool? No. That just by okay. No, no, Paul got into it. So obviously once Annabelle had sorted everything out, uh, like Paul got in touch and was like, oh, this is what I want to do. This is what I'm interested in. And then we had like, we had similarities and crossovers and the things that we liked. And based on that, I guess he was like, yeah, go on then. We'll, we'll give you a commission for it or whatever. Brilliant. Because he's, he's the architect of my eternal resting place. Right, okay. 
What's that? You know, you know about the pe the People's Pyramid that they're building in Liverpool. No. The KLF justified ancient Samumu. Oh, it's so, right. Okay, KLF. Yeah, now we're talking. But so ice what, cream van, that kind of thing. Yeah, that, yeah. So they 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 that yeah. So they they're building a pyramid out of dead people's ashes, and Paul was the architect of it. Holy f yeah, smokes. <laughs> I'll say smokes. Holy smokes. Yeah, smokes is quite. I must tell you. I'll tell you about that. Um, yeah, we'll we got we'll get too far off track. Um, right. So um, yeah, try and weave myself way slightly back into where we were. So yeah, I guess we are at that point at which I ask you how lockdowns affected your plans and uh, and whether you've got any kind of escape route planned or you're just kind of uh, winging it. Uh, you know, it's kind of it's changing half day by half day right now we've been doing these interviews since july so it's been quite a ride but yeah how how's your personal experience of it been i don't know i think like you know the the, the we first we, we were just about to do tales from the smog because we've done all the rehearsals and everything and everything got postponed and in, in, you know if i'm going to be perfectly honest we weren't quite ready to put it up in front of an audience and it almost felt like this whole thing came about and it was like, oh, it might get postponed, you know? And I was like, in my head, I was like, oh, well, I kind of hope it does, right? Because then I've got an extra couple of weeks to get everything together. And then, you know, now we're talking like almost a year later, so many people have died, so so many people's lives have been affected and disrupted and and it's kind of like, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty mad the way that different people are dealing with it and obviously you know everybody's entitled to do what they do what they think's right but it's a it's a tricky situation for everybody and I think like artistically for me uh, you try and do things digitally right and and one of the things that people always say here and they've been saying to you for for 10 plus years is oh you know you've got to, you've got to um, engage with your audience on a, on a digital platform and then you try and do it and it's like, it's not quite, it, it's, it's tricky. It's a really tricky, slippery little fish because you want to, all you, all you want to do is read your share stuff. But at the same time, I think I said earlier, you, there's, there's an amount of uh, anxiety or trepidation um, about, about sharing your work for a couple of reasons one of them being she, sometimes you you know you you don't think it's good enough or you're worried about what people will think and then the other thing is like yeah some of the feedback the, 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 you get the amount of feedback you get on it sometimes you're like oh it's like screaming into an echo chamber almost and you kind of think to yourself well is it because the work that i'm doing isn't good enough is it because people aren't interested? Is it because I don't engage with other people enough? And you know, you question, you know, your 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 digit your digital presence, if you like. And I mean, it's just on another note, you know, it's it's just not quite the same as as being able to go into a room with somebody and have a conversation in a theatre, for instance, you know. But um, but you got to be you got to focus on the positive and look. At, look at what you can do uh, to um, to continue creating art in a really a really tricky um, environment. And I mean, you said earlier you were like, oh, why don't you? You know, if you if you're applying for like indoor theatre, why don't you maybe think about doing it like outdoors, do like a driving of the show? And I think that would be you know pop a, like a fifties frame on top of it and get like you know all the all the soundtrack real real tice within the within the period get it set up outside the mecca bingo on a big projector screen and then uh yeah, yeah. Everyone pulls up in a car and watches the show i mean that would be pretty fantastic i think that's a great idea yeah and i don't know where it was was it in some, some city they they had uh, they had a theater show on the river like with a big screen over the river and people in boats i think that's another another yeah. thing you know yeah. That's, that's, that's things to make it fun but also really interested like do you know Ngugi Wa Tiongo? like he was a, a, a Kenyan um, theater playwright 
and um, he 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 got sent to prison for a year for writing a play in in a native language for the first time ever. But also his thing was completely demystifying the the, the, the process of making theatre. So uh, their their rehearsal space and everything was just like this open air area, a local youth centre. And so all the direction, everything, all the rehearsals took place and uh, and because some of the people that were walking past their dads or their granddads or their lives had been represented by some of the characters actually in the play, they'd come and say, no, we didn't say that. And they'd kind of end up being cast into roles. And so yeah. it's like it was that everybody partook of and, and in, an, in an outdoor space. And that was a key element of it. So I just think, um, you know, maybe that's maybe that's something to think about that uh, showing people how you make theatre so everyone can start making theatre for themselves might be might be a positive thing to come out of all of this well it's it's that thing isn't it you know the after idea we, after we went to prison for the year for writing the play in his native language he secretly wrote his first novel in in his native language on uh toilet uh tracing paper like toilet roll yeah while he was in prison yeah so when he came out he had a book to publish so yeah good on him he was just at the end of it he was like right, see you later guys and by the way fuck you <laughs> great yeah, I mean, he was exiled after that, but he did get to move back and uh, with full honours and obviously fully embraced by everybody these days. Cool. Anyway, we, we've got really sidetracked again. Sorry. I mean, it's probably for the best, I think. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, you've got to think to the positive. Well, it's you, been an you, absolute joy to meet you, Scott. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, are you taping this? I am, yeah, but I, I can I can cut the end off. No, it's all right. No, no, I'm fine. I just noticed that I'm wearing a, a polo neck, and that's not my uh, that's not my, my natural attire. It's you know I wasn't like oh oh I'll be doing a, a Zoom meeting later. I'd better wear my polo neck. It's just that um, that I was meant to be going to Berlin, and so I've packed all my stuff into storage, and now I've been wearing this for however many days. So thankfully you can see me, but you can't smell me. <laughs> yeah, smell o vision. We thought we'd have that by now. <laughs> finally, in the year we finally get jet packs, you know, but I guess we have to well, have you take seen, them off um, with a smooth. Have you seen um, uh, Polystyrene? So, um, so do, do you know Paulson? No. Right, he's. Uh, I, that was my first ever creative thing I ever did in in uh, Teesside was getting his film about Sleaford Mods put on at the Ark, like Invisible right, Bridge. Okay, and um, so we've kind of kept in touch over time. And um, so he's he's making a film about polystyrene called um, I Am a Cliche uh, with with Celeste, Polly's daughter. And, really. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so basically, about, I don't know, about four months, so, so he lives up in Edinburgh and he feels that things were a bit awfully London centric. So I kind of proposed to them that when the film is finished, because that's been delayed with all this, uh, that they have kind of like a big event in, in, in Middlesbrough for, for its launch rather than down in London. Um, and uh, they seem, they se I like described what was going on and like, um, everything that's happening here in the scene. So they they kind of seem quite up for that. So we might have to yeah, do yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that sounds perfect. whole um, polystyrene weekender. <laughs> great, yeah, great, great. <laughs> <laughs>